Good evening. It's been a, what an amazing day, huh? Got all these people running from all day, and, and, and I think we're going to go pretty late into the night, too. So, this is great. So, welcome. Uh, I'm Hassan Ilahi. I'm, I'm an artist, and uh, it's odd for me being an artist to be in a lot of these situations with all these amazing scientists and thinkers and, uh, and finance people. But uh, I think it's kind of interesting because I think we normally think of the role of the artist in a very, well, non-creative way. Uh, and it's kind of ironic given that artists are in the job of creativity. And I think one of the things that I'd like to propose is maybe let's, let's try to think about what an artist does, not necessarily from, uh, from the traditional definition of what the arts are, but maybe let's replace creativity with innovation. And sometimes some of the wackiest ideas can actually have some very realistic uh, uh, results. So I'm going to show you a little project that I started a while ago. And, uh, and this is a project, uh, it's probably about almost, uh, well, almost 10 years ago now that, that led to this project. And uh, when I started this, this, the last thing on my mind was this is, hey, I, I got some new art project going on here. But what it really is, is uh, I think more of a how an artist reacts to a uh, condition. And in my case, uh, this, that would be being reported to the FBI as a terrorist. So there was a report that, uh, an erroneous report, I should correct, uh, many years ago from, well, I can't really prove who it was, but I have a pretty good idea of who it was, that said uh, an Arab man was hoarding explosives in a storage unit in Tampa, Florida. Never mind I'm not Arab, never mind I hope that it wasn't the 12th, never mind I had winter clothes in the storage unit and nothing else. But it doesn't matter, you know, if you see something, say something, particularly, you know, even if it's wrong. So, in this culture of uh, just uh, constantly uh, watching out for something and being afraid of the next thing, um, you know, it was, it was a pretty scary moment because I had spent literally six months of my life with the FBI justifying every moment and every second explaining to them, look, I'm not a terrorist, this is a mistake. And eventually after the, the whole thing ended, it ended with nine consecutive polygraphs in one sitting. So I was sitting down there and there's all these wires coming out and you know, it's like, and you could only answer a yes or no. It's like, is today Tuesday? Yes. Is, is, are we in Florida? Yes. Is your name Hassan? Yes. Do you belong to any groups that wish to harm the United States? You know, all these types of detailed questions and really just it's kind of scary because then you go into this real sedative mode where you kind of just go in this, you float off in this other world and I, I don't know what I answered, but I, I obviously I think I answered the right things because otherwise I wouldn't be here right now talking to you. So shortly after I said, guys, uh, and, and oh, so, so after that, my FBI agent that was working with me, he, le he leaves a room and then, uh, then comes back and says, everything's fine. I was like, I know everything's fine. That's what I've been trying to tell you for, you know, for half a year. But uh, can I get a letter saying everything's fine? Because all we need is the last guy not to get the last memo at the last airport. And here we go all over again. But there's a little problem there because in order to be formally cleared, you have to be formally charged. <laughs> and in these days of the magic wand of terrorism and national security, well, you know, there was no formal charge. Everything was outside. And uh, so I was like, well, guys, this is a real problem. What do I do? I mean, I travel a lot. And they said, well, if you get into trouble, here's some phone numbers, give us a call, we'll take care of it. I said, great, wonderful. So before I would go anywhere, I would call my FBI agent. <laughs> and I would tell him, this is where I'm going. It's not because I had to. I was not required to do this by any means. It's that I, I chose to do it. I volunteered. It's like, look, guys, I don't want to make it look like I'm raising any red flags, or I don't want to make it look like I'm running off somewhere. I want you to know, this is what I'm doing. He's like, okay, thank you. you know, so I'll pass this on to the local office at everything, uh, lo local airport. Everything will be fine. And then a few weeks later, I'd call again. I said, okay, what's your flight number? I'd give him my itinerary. He says, okay, no problem. Uh, we'll take care of it. And then, you know, this went on for about, uh, this went on for months and months and months. The emails, I'm sorry, the phone calls turned to emails. The emails got longer and longer and really long and with lots of pictures added to them. Then I'd make websites specifically for my FBI agent. <laughs> and then, you know, I'd write, write pages and pages and pages. And uh, he would always write back, thank you, be safe. So it was a really unbalanced relationship. It's like, you know, I give and I give and I give and I tell them all these things. And all I get back is these four words. So it's really frustrating. I mean, you know that relationship, you know, you, you just, 
It's just really one-sided, and you're telling them all these things, and they, they don't really respond. I mean, they're good listeners, but they're not very sharing. So I decided, well, wait a minute, why, why, is, why is it that only, why, he's so, why is he so special? So then I realized, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create this little, uh, this little, uh, 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 this, uh, well, I guess it would be called an app now, but it was this really clunky code that I wrote for my uh, Nokia phone, which was about that thick. And, uh, I, I, and this was about 2003. And uh, I wrote up this really primitive software that tracked me. In, in, uh, in real time, so you could see exactly where I was at what time and everything. And uh, so like you can see that on the 23rd of June, I used these urinals, and on the 26th of November, I pumped gas at this place at Southern Nevada. Uh, and, and you can see this arrow that follows me around. So you can see where we are right now at the, at the, at the theater arena over here, and you can see there's an arrow coming, pointing at me. Let's go in a little further, and you know, we're kind of there. We can go in even further. And, and you can see that there's a river that's running right by this, and then we can go in even deeper. And, then you, and, and basically, this is where we are right here. Uh, me, uh, that's that pixel right over there. So, you know, it's kind of interesting because these days we're kind of used to seeing ourselves as pixels because, you know, historically we used to open up the map and you'd have to look around and go, we're over here. And now you just take out that thing out of your pocket, you hit that little button, and you become the center of that map. I think there's a very different way of looking at ourselves within data. Oh, by the way, these are some of the toilets that I've been using because, you know, the FBI needs to know what I'm doing. So, so, they have, they, so basically what I decided is that I was going to open up every aspect of my life, every moment, every few minutes, and I just keep continuously sending them these images. So, you know, that uh, on, on this day, at, on, on the 31st of November, I was at this uh, market in, in San Diego. I, I don't have a dog, but I was walking by this place where with these dog things, and then you can see it in Rangeley, Maine. I was there on the 18th of, Saturday, uh, of July, August 7th in western Pennsylvania at this gas station. So these are all images that have been used in there. So when you look at the images, so th this top part is, this is, those are those images that are flashing by, and the bottom part are the, are the uh, maps of, uh, of exactly where I am. You can go all the way out and you can see everything that's going on here. Or you can, and then, so what's happening in this thing is basically every few moments I timestamp my life, and there's a record of me every every time. So not only that there's uh, that I'm providing you a map and a uh, and and the photo of where I am, but now you have my bank and my uh, my airlines and all those that are actually verifying that yes, indeed, I was here at this time and this time and this point. And you know, it's kind of interesting because when I first started this project, people thought I was crazy. People thought, why in the world would you want to do this? Why do you want to share every moment of everything? You know, it's kind of, and people at first thought it was kind of creepy. And ironically, uh, you know, there's nearly a billion people that are, actually I think Facebook just hit a billion last week. So there's, uh, so one out of seven people in the world are basically doing something not that different uh, every time you're uh, updating your status or sending an image or posting an image or sending a message, uh, writing on someone's wall. And when you look at that, when you put that together, I mean, let's, let's, put, that, let's put that in some perspective here. You know, if Facebook was a country, it would be the third largest country after China and India. And it's significantly growing every day. So now we're all doing this, we're all creating these archives, but a lot of it is also how are we creating this archive and how, what's happening. So in a way, everything's out there and everything about my life is out there. I mean, you know that on this day, at this time, I went here, and, and at that set, I cooked that at home on January 5th at 12.40 a.m. But what you're actually seeing is, by me putting all this out there, every little detail, all these pieces of evidence, I actually live an incredibly anonymous and private life. You know almost nothing about me because I'm giving you so much information. And I'm giving you so much noise that actually what, what's happening is I'm actually living in this camouflaged life. It's a data body, and I think we're all creating our own data bodies and archives as we're going through these. So one of the things that to, to consider is that you know, we all need to be responsible for our data. How do we create this? So one of the things that happens is you, know, you come in and you punch in someone's name in Google or something. If, if the only thing that pops up is something that's not terribly flattering, you can't just go to Google and say, hey, you know, delete me off this. this uh, the internet doesn't forget. And I think this is a very, very crucial 
point here, and I think one of the things is that as more and more and more of our information is posted, and, and, and you may not post it, but someone else might, how do we realize which one, is, which one is accurate, which one is important? And how do we actually regain privacy in this world? And so my thing is, let's put it all out there. Let's put it all out there, because if everything is out there, it would force us to rethink what we think about uh, with, uh, in private information. Because particularly in terms of the FBI, one of the things that's happened is by me borrowing a very simple principles of economics, by me flooding the market, the information that the FBI has about me has no value. So therefore, all the value is directly to you. So we, if you cut out the middleman, it, it devalues their currency. And really what's happening is, you know, and I realize on, a, on an individual basis, this is merely symbolic. This is absolutely symbolic because, you know, it doesn't really affect the FBI's database at the end of the day. But if a billion people did this, you would force an entire redesign of information. And it's not really about having the information, it really is about analyzing it, this information. And, and how does this information make sense? And what's important? What's noise and what's signal? So one of the things I have to say, and, and the, this project's been, I mean, it's been amazing for me over the years. I mean, it's led to numerous exhibitions and uh, amazing things have happened. And I, mean, I have to thank one person in particular for this. And uh, that would be this man. This is uh, Dick Cheney, vice, a former vice president. And uh, I think, you know, if it wasn't for him, none of this would be ever possible because it was his, his uh, initiatives and uh, his vision that kind of started the whole, uh, you know, if you see, you know, just the, just the thing, the, 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 the state of, uh, the, state of uh, the life that we're in, in, in a lot of ways, particularly in the U.S. So I was very, uh, a few years ago, I was very excited that uh, I finally, I, I accepted a position just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, at the University of Maryland. And uh, so I wanted to go see him in person and thank him for you know, helping with all these, all these things. And uh, so I went and, but you know, when you go on Google, or at the time when he was in office, when you went to, when you went to Google, uh, his house was blurred. You couldn't see his house. And on, on the left over here, you see when, when Dick Cheney was in office, that's what his house was. Uh, this is where the vice president lives in the Naval Observatory in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C. And on the right is where, when Joe Biden took office. So here's a person that actually went to the trouble and also had the resources to remain this incredibly private person. So then I started thinking, okay, well, and then after he left office, I was like, well, I, I still would like to see him and I'd like to, you know, say thanks. So then I started looking around. And so I was looking through some of these, uh, so I went, uh, I, went, I went by his house. And uh, so this is his uh, front yard or his fr front uh, driveway. And then you, know, you see his house over there. Uh, the images look a little odd, they're actually paintings, but they're photographs of paintings of photographs. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a, this detached of a detachment of a detachment. And so anyway, so you know, you're getting closer to his house and uh, he's got a really, you know, three car garage. He's got a really sweet pool. Check that out, I mean, it's a really amazing place. And then, you know, you go in, his uh, part of his living room overlooking the, the water over there. This is backing up in the living room on the other corner. Uh, and going towards his dining room over there. This is a sort of a in-between dining room near, near the kitchen. This is his bedroom. This is where he sleeps. This is where he eats over here. Uh, another guest room that he has. His uh, upstairs bathroom. And, uh, and it's kind of, it kind of well, how did, how did I get these images? Well, this is all publicly available. And again, I really want to put this in perspective. If this man went to the extreme of remaining private and of, to the point where Google, he had Google blur out his house. And yet, at the same time, this stuff is available online. You can actually go, actually what happened is I started, you know, there was a no-fly zone over his house. And, uh, and so I started looking at aeronautical charts and I realized that, you know, obviously you can't fly over certain military bases, you can't fly over certain ecologically protected areas, but there's this one part of his, near this neighborhood where for no reason there's a no-fly zone. So, I, so it's a hole, and I started looking all the property records inside the hole, and then I found the property, and then I was looking at you know, all these property transactions at that time, and this person sold to this person, this person sold to this person, it's all public record. Then all of a sudden you see you know, the estate of Dorothy Rose sold the house to Sumner LLC. I'm thinking, well, who's Sumner LLC? Well, it turns out that this is a uh, LLC registered in, in Wyoming, in, uh, Teton, to a PO box in Teton Village, Wyoming. 
and then thus I was able to cross-reference those uh, uh, that address with this with that and then find the listing for the house and get the image. so even though uh, you know all we really needed a name and a and and then you could often pretty much figure out what the inside of someone's house looks like which is kind of creepy when you think about it but this is very real and very possible so in the same way so uh, it, you know again if, if, I, if I can really emphasize uh, it's not about hiding it's it's no longer about detaching we, we're not going to go back we're not going to stop using mobile phones we're not going to stop uploading images everything will be up there but I think we really need to be uh, we literally need to curate our information and our data bodies online. We have to be very selective about what we're putting out there. So having said that, I think it's really important to that, that we do it ourselves, because if we don't do it ourselves, someone else will. And when someone else will do it, it will be wrong. And I think that's a tremendous danger to us. So with that, thank you very much.